This is the story of a people. A people whose ancestral homeland comprised 330 islands which straddle the meridian, the longitudinal center of the planet Earth. It's where each new day begins. These islands are the Fiji Islands. According to archaeological evidence, Viti, or Fiji, was first settled approximately 1500 BC. This has been determined by the discovery of a very distinctive form of pottery, which has come to be known as Lapita pottery, after the Lapita people who settled and left traces of their pottery in a number of Pacific Islands. There are also vivid oral histories relating to the settlement of the Fiji Islands. Whatever our true origin, the first recorded sighting of Fiji by a non-Pacific Islander was by Abel Tasman in 1643. This discovery of Fiji would be the first in a long history of contact and interaction between Fijians and Europeans. Prior to first contact, and for quite a while after, Fijians were not a united collective entity, but rather a collection of fiercely competitive chieftains, each with its own elaborate network of alliances. These alliances usually followed familial ties, but this was not always the case. The arrival of the Europeans brought a constant flood of challenges for the Fijian people. Europeans arrived with a wide array of interests. Some were missionaries, some were sealers, some were traders, some were farmers, and their growing interaction and influence over the indigenous people gave rise to tensions. The traditional way of life was beginning to disintegrate. There were disagreements over land deals, strange new diseases were wiping out whole villages, the sale of firearms had escalated the nature of warfare. There was blackbirding, and on the whole, disagreements and violence were on the rise. In 1848, a Fourth of July celebration accident resulted in the burning of the home of the United States Consul, John Williams, on Nukulau Island. This gave way to looting by a group of indigenous opportunists and led to a chain of events resulting in the ceding of Fiji to Great Britain. Ratuseru Dakumbau, a leading Fijian chief and self-proclaimed King of Fiji, was blamed for the Nukulau incident and the United States demanded he pay $5,000 in damages. The United States would continue to press the Kambal, increasing the monies due to $45,000. Between 1867 and 1869, there were two different governments in Fiji, the Kingdom of Mbau and the Fijian Eastern Confederation, established by Tongan chief Enele Ma'afu. In 1871, the settlers endeavored to establish a settled form of government with Mbau chief Rakambau as king of Fiji. A constitution was agreed upon and a parliament elected, but it did not last due to infighting. Then, in 1873, Commodore Goodenough and Mr. E. L. Layard, Her Majesty's Consul in Fiji, were commissioned to investigate and report on the constitutional situation in the Fiji Islands. On March the 21st, 1874, they reported on the offer of sovereignty of the islands of Fiji from the chiefs of Fiji, led by Rata Dakumba. The European settlers in Fiji at the time also approved of the offer, 
which led to the appointment of Sir Hercules Robinson to further negotiate. This was a time of great uncertainty in Fiji. All these tensions were combining to put enormous pressure on the people and their leadership. And, in the end, the chiefs of Fiji sought the guidance and wisdom of Great Britain to protect and care for Fiji. The negotiations were completed and Fiji was ceded to Her Majesty, Queen Victoria of Great Britain, on the 10th of October, 1874. We, King of Fiji, together with other High Chiefs of Fiji, hereby give our country Fiji unreservedly to Her Britannic Majesty, Queen of Great Britain and Ireland. And we trust and repose fully in her that she will rule Fiji justly and affectionately, that we may continue to live in peace and prosperity. And we, desiring these conferences, may terminate well and satisfactorily Request Her Britannic Majesty's Ambassador unto us, Sir Hercules George Robert Robinson, to confer with our advisors who have our confidence in these matters. Signed, Dakambo. Pastor Sulia, Enabundongo, Givona Ranandi, Milutaki, Mawa. Isa, Ningambono, Mononongo, Banoa. As the King desires, transmit it to Her Majesty, accompanied by a full expression of the King's wishes. The ceding of Fiji was signed by the 13 leading chiefs. The deed of session not only symbolized the ceding of Fiji to Great Britain, but also heralded the birth of the Council of Chiefs. The Great Council of Chiefs originated as a response to Fiji's political climate immediately before the deed of session. Its formation is rooted in Clause 7 of the deed of session, which states, quote, that on behalf of Her Majesty, His Excellency Sir Hercules George Robert Robinson promises one, that the rights and interests of the said Tuiviti and other High Chiefs, the seeding parties hereto, shall be recognized so far as it is consistent with British sovereignty and colonial form of government. Two, that all questions of financial liabilities and engagements shall be scrutinized and dealt with upon principles of justice and sound public policy, and three, that all claims to titles of land by whomsoever preferred, and all claims to pensions or allowances, whether on the part of the said Tuiviti and other high chiefs, or of persons now holding office under them, or any of them, shall in due course be fully investigated and equitably adjusted." End quote. eighteen seventy five at the council meeting in Raimba, Oberlau, the British charter to establish the Fiji Islands into a separate colony called the Colony of Fiji was adopted. The charter had eleven clauses on how the Colony of Fiji was to be governed. Also in eighteen seventy five the position of Rocco was created and the chiefly representative of Her Majesty the Queen, Fiji's first governor, Sir Arthur Hamilton Gordon, was installed. The Roccos were appointed as provincial administrators to assist the colonial government to develop and monitor policies and programs regarding the welfare of the Fijian people.
In 1876, the chief's meeting was held in Waikawa, Vanua Levu. A significant meeting for Fiji, as it was during this meeting that the Native Affairs Ordinance of 1876 was established. This ordinance was concerned with the governing of the Fijian people. A feature of this Council of Chiefs meeting was the report on census of the peoples in the provinces. The chiefs were slowly being introduced to commercial activities such as provincial levies, purchasing of boats and foreign goods, and were becoming acquainted with the new form of governance. The Council of Chiefs, as representatives of the Fijian people, enjoyed a benevolent relationship with the Crown during colonization and beyond. This relationship has always been based on goodwill and trust. Readily submitted to the authority of the Crown, even acknowledging the Queen as the highest chief of the land. Sir Arthur Gordon used the existing chiefly system to his advantage. From it he formed Yasana, or provinces, and the chiefs of these chiefdoms received a government appointment as Rokotui, or provincial commissioners. The tribal chiefs then, as Rokos or provincial chiefs, with the assistance of the then governor Sir Arthur Gordon, formed an advisory body to the colonial government on matters about the Fijian people. Thus the birth of the august body, the Council of Chiefs. Sir Arthur Gordon, as the governor of the colony of Fiji, was faced with many pressing problems. The Fijians were generally dispirited as the result of a recent devastating measles epidemic and were anxious about their land. For the administration of justice in the provinces, Sir Arthur Gordon also established courts through the colony. The jurisdiction of these courts affected Fijian parties only and its extent varied according to the type of court. The language of the courts was Fijian. <laughs> to meet the expenses of the administration of the provinces, a modest levy, raised collectively, was authorized by Resolution 13 of the 1878 Council of Chiefs meeting in Rewa. This was known as the Soliniasana Regulation of 1878. The principle of that regulation is still in force today. That is the annual levy of a rate fixed by the representatives of the people of the province and used as decided by them for the common good. These rates formed the largest item of revenue in the annual budget of each province. While it's not commonly known, the Council of Chiefs were fully aware of the economic activities of the colony at the time. So much so that the Council of Chiefs meeting in Bua, 1878, the ninth resolution was, quote, If the government can arrange for sugar works, which we are fully of opinion that planting of sugarcane will be the easiest and best cultivation for the province of Rewa and portion of Tailevu, in which we believe they will obtain their taxes with much greater ease and have much larger surpluses." End quote. Gordon's native policy was aimed primarily at securing the Fijians in their ownership and occupancy of their lands, and in preventing any sudden disruptions in their social organization, the very basis upon which the native administration was founded.
This policy of Sir Arthur Gordon, forbidding Fijians to work in the sugarcane plantations, together with the commercial activities of the colony, saw the arrival of indentured laborers in May 1879. In the Council of Chiefs meeting in the same year, on the island of Mbau, the chiefs desired for the establishment of an industrious school, Wulinitu, for Fijian youth. The 1880 Council of Chiefs meeting in Mualewu, in Honuambalawu, Lao, attended by Sir Arthur Gordon, was crucial for Fijians. What we're doing now is something that we've been doing in this area of the Pacific for hundreds of years, even thousands of years. The provincial council that I will be attending uh, is, has also a very long tradition. It is similar to the council that was held on that mound behind me in 1880, the first ever council of chiefs held in Mualevu, in Lao. It was the meeting attended by Sir Arthur Gordon on an important mission when he came to pronounce on behalf of the Queen the confirmation of the ownership of our land. With the return of land by the Crown to the native owners, the Council of Chiefs had decided on land sale policies. From 1881 to 1892, the annual meeting of the chiefs was held throughout various provinces. Issues discussed at the meetings were also changing to include change in lifestyle, health issues, time management, and so on. With the dawn of the new century in the 1900s, the chiefs were concerned about land boundaries. And, at an earlier meeting held in Suva, 1890, the chiefs called on His Excellency Sir John Bates Thurston, the governor then, to look into land claims by white settlers. From 1902 to 1920, all the Council of Chiefs meetings were held in Raimba Suva. In this 18-year period, the Council of Chiefs finally established a resolution passed in earlier meetings. The resolution was to open a school specifically for the education of young Fijian chiefs. This period also saw the first Volani Lawani Tauke, or native regulations. With the break of the First World War and the two economic depressions, it seemed that there was a lull period for the affairs of the Fijian people and their leaders. However, 
This saw active service of over 700 men, including a Fijian labor corps, in active service in Europe and the Middle East. The active service of young Fijian men with the blessing of the Council of Chiefs also included Ratuse Chosefa, Lalambalavu, Wanayali Yali Sukuna, a young chief of the time. In 1924, the Council of Chiefs celebrated its Golden Jubilee in Nassau, on the island of Obalau, on the 10th of October, 1924. <laughs> Leading up to the celebrations, the Council of Chiefs nominated three chiefs to visit England to convey expressions of humble loyalty of the Fijian people to His Majesty the King. The delegation consisted of Ratu J. A. Rambidi, Ratu P. Veli, and Ratu Sukuna. Between 1925 and 1935, only four meetings were held, three of which in Suva, and one on the island of Mbau. At the 1930 meeting, also in Suva, the chiefs decided that the sum of 820 pounds collected for the benefit of returned soldiers be divided equally between the members of the Labour Corps. In 1933, the chiefs' annual meeting held in Bau discussed the disbursement of funds of approximately 1,000 pounds to be used purposely for building a model Fijian village in the neighborhood of Suva. Significantly, this is where the new Council of Chiefs complex is located. From 1936 to 1946, only six meetings were held. High on the agenda of these meetings was education. The chiefs were of the view that agricultural training was in the best interests of the native race, and their desire to establish an agricultural school to educate selected youth in all the branches of agriculture. In the Council of Chiefs meeting held in Somosomo in 1838, Governor Sir Arthur Richards, in addressing the chiefs, advised that it would be best for government to pass a Native Lands Trust Ordinance. This followed an earlier request by the chiefs in 1936 for government to control all the land. The proposed Native Lands Trust Ordinance would give government the powers to deal with native land and it would be bound by law to operate in the best interests of Fijians. It took four years of convincing the council to accept the Native Lands Trust Ordinance. This was eventually passed by the Legislative Council as Ordinance 12 of 1940. Until 1940, Fijians negotiated the leasing of their land as they chose to make available. They dealt directly with competing tenants and lease terms varied from contract to contract. Agriculture, through the sugar industry, was driving Fiji's economic development, and Fijian chiefs were pressed with the urgent issue 
of the usage of their land. Ratu Salala Sakuna, who was now a member of the Council of Chiefs and also a legislative council member, was in the best position to address the interests of the Fijian people, whose primary concern was the land issue. National demands were pressing. The need to provide land for a growing Indian farming population was clear, and the only land owned in quantity was Fijian. The Council of Chiefs this time turned to one of its great sons, Ratusalal Sakuna. In 1933, Ratusalal Sakuna told the Council of Chiefs in Mbao, quote, We regard the Indian desire for more permanent tenancy as a natural and legitimate consequence of an agricultural community settling in any country. Close quote. The Native Land Trust Board scheme emerged as an answer. Directly related to the Native Lands Trust Ordinance Resolution 12 of 1940. Ratu Josefa Lalambalabu Bonayali Ali Sukuna was a member of the Council of Chiefs. A scholar, soldier and statesman, Ratu Lala is regarded as the forerunner of the post-independence leadership of Fiji. His vision during his lifetime set the course that Fiji was now to follow in the years to come. One of his visionary creations is the present Native Lands Trust Board and Native Lands Commission. The setting up of these two important Fijian institutions was in consultation with the Council of Chiefs. The two institutions assisted successive governments in Fiji in the economic and social development of Fiji. <laughs> It was one of the wisest of Fiji's colonial governors, Sir Arthur Richards, who first offered to Ratuzukuna the seed of an idea that produced the Native Lands Trust Board. Ratuzalal Sakuna was the first Fijian to be appointed Native Lands Commissioner and implemented the Native Lands Act when he was Deputy Commissioner in the early 1920s. Later, during his tenure as Native Land Commissioner, Rat Salal Sakuna established native ownership of lands. He surveyed, recorded, registered ownership of more than 80% of native land. The registration of native ownership was an exceptional achievement for any native race under colonial rule. It guaranteed native title to indigenous Fijians in perpetuity and conferred a legal protection in favor of native Fijian title to their land. It took 10 years for Ratusukuna to convince chiefs of the importance of opening up native land for the development of the nation. Sadly though, the only form of return indigenous peoples have from this gesture is the low rent and royalties they collect at regular intervals. With the generosity and blessings of the great council of chiefs, land was opened up for the economic benefit of the country. The Great Council of Chiefs was also concerned with Fijian education, and with their foresight, some of Fiji's leading schools were established, like Queen Victoria School and Andi Thakambao School for education of Fijians. On health issues, it also assisted in the establishment of the Tuomi Hospital on Makongai to accommodate those who suffered from leprosy. <laughs> the latter half of the 19th century brought a different political climate for the Fijian people and the Council of Chiefs. 
Up to this time, the Fijian people had taken only a detached interest in national politics. Fiji then was governed under the Legislative Council. Most of them were Europeans, and there was token Fijian representation. Membership of this council was by election. As Fiji developed and the population increased, demands for seats on the Legislative Council by Indians increased also. Party politics emerged and there were disturbances in the sugar industry, the mainstay of Fiji's economy. Meanwhile, around the world, decolonization was setting in and Fiji was on the path to self-government. Again, four members of the Council of Chiefs, who were direct descendants of some of the chiefs who signed the deed of session, rose to the call of the nation to take Fiji to a new era of self-rule. The Council of Chiefs was then blessed with visionary leaders and high chiefs. One of those was the late Ratusa George Kandabu Lebu Dakambau, who held the title Wunivalu Avambau, the traditional head of the Kambuna Confederacy. Ratusa George Dakambau was a leading figure in politics and was also Fiji's first Governor General, just before Fiji's independence. Kandabu Lebu Dakambau to be our Governor General and Commander in Chief of Fiji. I, George Kandabulevu Thakambau, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. I, George Kandabulevu Thakambau, do swear I would, that I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors in the office of Governor General of Fiji. So help me God. Independence heralded a new era for Fiji, the Fijians and the Council of Chiefs. The leadership of this challenging era was again provided by the Council of Chiefs through the founding father of modern Fiji, the late Ratsu Kamise Semara. Tuilau, Tuinayau, and Saunibunwakolau, the paramount chief of Lao. The late Ratusa Kamise Semara was groomed for leadership of the nation by Ratusa Lala Sukuna. Ratusa Kamise Semara was Fiji's first prime minister and took Fiji through the transition period of independence from British rule to parliamentary democracy. The Council of Chiefs, under the leadership of Ratu Solala Sukuna, also groomed another high chief and statesman who contributed immensely to Fiji and the Council of Chiefs. Recognized as the paramount chief of the Tobata Confederacy, holding the title Tuivekau, the traditional ruler of the Vakonrove province, the late Ratu Sepenayang Anilau was one of the three highest ranking chiefs in Fiji, a moderate conservative and a proud son of the chiefly Aisokula clan. At the pinnacle of his illustrious career for the people of Fiji, Ratusa Penayanganilao led Fiji during its most turbulent political times and was Fiji's last governor general and its first president as Fiji became a republic. Another member of the Council of Chiefs was the late Ratu Sir Edward Tuibonwabo Tungi Dakambau. Ratu Edward Dakambau commanded the Fiji Infantry Regiment at the Second World War and was awarded the Military Cross. Ratu Edward also played a major role in Fiji's politics and became Deputy Prime Minister after independence in the Ratu Sir Kamisese Mara-led government. The transition from the colonial era to self-rule had a significant role to the Council of Chiefs, 
whereby they became part of government. The Council of Chiefs history stretches right back to the 1800s. Retained as a consultative body by the British colonial rulers, it had no formal political role. This changed after Fiji became independent in 1970. Under the 1970 constitution, it gained the authority to nominate eight of 22 senators. Today, the Great Council of Chiefs nominates 14 out of 32, and also serves as an electoral college to choose the president and the vice president of Fiji. In addition, they were also part of the 1970 constitutional process which led to Fiji's independence. Fiji could be said to have enjoyed its best in the first decade of independence. Fiji's progress since session is a record of achievement, social, economic and political, which must be beyond the highest hopes of some of our forebears. Your advance has been particularly impressive during the last decade more so since in that time you have assumed control of your own destiny. But this progress has not come of its own accord. It has demanded industry, devotion, perseverance and vision from many people. Some, I am pleased to say, from my own country. Finally, I have been entrusted with a message from Her Majesty the Queen which I am very pleased to now deliver. It says, I am very glad to have this opportunity to send a message to my people in Fiji. First of all, I congratulate you on the 10th anniversary of your independence. The 70s were difficult years and Fiji has done well to come through them in a strong position economically and socially as it has done. I send my very best wishes for your future welfare and prosperity. Signed, Elizabeth R. Of the 16 Council of Chief meetings, from 1970 to 1986, four were held in Suva. The critical issue discussed during these times was the Agriculture Landlord and Tenants Ordinance. In 1978, the Council of Chiefs met at Tumbau Lakamba, Lao. So, with the colourful opening ceremonies over, the Governor-General responds, and the Great Council of Chiefs meeting at Lakemba is officially open. I wish to thank the Twinau and Prime Minister of Fiji, Ratu Kamasesimara, and the people of Lao Province for honouring the Great Council of Chiefs by inviting it and acting as its host 
on this occasion. Your speeches during the ceremonies breathe reassurances and faithfully reflected the true spirit of Fijian people, that of deep respect, patience, kindness and hospitality, combined with inborn quiet confidence. We have ever increasing racial harmony and have maintained law and order. However, there is yet much to be done. Success can only be achieved if we all cooperate and work together. I look to the great council of chiefs to concern itself and to take a leading role in this very important area of our development. I pray God's richest blessing on your deliberations during this week's important and historical meeting. Fiji's relationship with the Crown has always been very close. Throughout the decades, several members of the British royal family have graced our shores. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II herself has been to Fiji on several occasions, and even attended a meeting of this august body. Chiefs and people of Fiji, Prince Philip and I thank you for the ceremonies of welcome with which you have received us this morning. Although this is not the first time we have been welcomed to Fiji by these age-old customs and traditions, it is the first occasion on which you have performed them for us in this historic setting of Mbao, and this has brought home to us more vividly their meaning and significance. And I particularly appreciate being invited to open the meeting of the Great Council of Chiefs. What you have shown in the past makes me confident that you will approach them as a united country, determined to act in the best interest of all your people and in the spirit of justice, harmony and tolerance, which have been the hallmarks of your country for a long time. I shall continue to follow your progress with great interest, knowing that the chiefs of Fiji will continue to extend great influence for the good and for the happiness and prosperity of all the people of this land. I have much pleasure in declaring open this meeting of the Great Council of Chiefs. In 1986, the Council of Chiefs meeting held in Somosomotabuni broke from tradition, where the public were allowed to listen to the proceedings of the meeting. <laughs> Matai, ni so sa kan na matangali, katigo sa kan nongrangele na koro sa kan rangele taun dosa. Kano ka sa nandu sa ngaun na metoso tiko na itigo tuni koro, yan na yano sa ngaun na mesa na kan rangele na matangali sa ratio kina koro tinta. Isa na koro tulo. Na wakasan pipi mga iba ngang kai, er ngang kai tin sa kai pini tuki ni ngele kasa posto kina koro. In 1986, the Ratumara-led alliance government lost the general elections. The peace and tranquility Fiji had enjoyed was abruptly disturbed in 1987 when Colonel Sitiveni Rambuka carried out Fiji's first coup. The Council of Chiefs was faced with a major crisis, and the event marked another change in Fiji's trajectory. Following the 87 coups, the chiefs met twice. The first meeting was held from the 19th to the 26th of May, and the other on the 20th to the 28th of July. The Kambimbi Dinasara and Abula Nikawai Taukei Merongozi Wabinasara and Nomuni and Noma and Sauni Banua and Aveka and Balet and Nate Taukei. Me vaka di satan dola tu na ngau ni sala ni posa vaka don dou e na ya vun don don ni tamata ya ndua e na ngau na ngo e lewe vunga e rasa posa ya ndua se vaka isongo songo e na vuku ni taukei e na so na ngau na sala ki sika sarayani na posa 
Monsieur Bonavie Cabot Turang. Yes, and don't know on a balavo, no nomuni banding an altic on a sony vanoa. Cover a vinavinakin of a levu. The Sate Vura and Bakyongo, no nomuni vevasaki. The Rongozi Vamatata Sarakin and a nomuni in a noma. And a vika a taran a bullanita okay. As Fiji and the whole world held its breath, the Great Council of Chiefs stepped into the forefront to bring calm to a volatile situation. Fiji and the Great Council turned to one of its own, Ratusakamisha Semara, to steer Fiji out of turbulent waters. Since the 2000 coup, however, the Council has worked with mixed success to regain its independence. In 2001, the Great Council of Chiefs dismissed 1987 coup leader and former Prime Minister Siti Vanirambuka from its chairmanship in the midst of allegations about his possible involvement in the 2000 coup. It has also cut its former ties with the Fijian political party which it originally sponsored in the early 90s and declared its intention to steer clear from party politics in the future. Although individual members of the council will, of course, remain free to participate in politics as individuals. The 2000 civilian coup shook Fiji again, and this time by civilian leader George Spate. The Great Council of Chiefs was looked upon to provide leadership at this time of crisis. Despite Fiji now being a republic within the Commonwealth of Nations, the Great Council still recognizes Queen Elizabeth II as Fiji's paramount chief. The new millennium heralded many new issues and challenges for the Council of Chiefs. Whilst they were thrust into the political arena, not by choice, they rose to the occasion to tackle emerging issues that were affecting the native population. Following the 2000 upheaval, the Great Council of Chiefs, chaired by Ratu Epelinganilau, addressed social ills that were having an impact on the Fijian population. During these meetings, the chiefs thoroughly addressed drug problems and the increase in HIV-positive cases in the Fijian community. When the chairmanship of the council changed in 2004, with the late Ratu Ovinian Bukhini taking up the chair, he raised concerns regarding chiefly leadership. Emphasizing the need for developing a curriculum for chiefly leadership suited for the great council of chiefs. Additionally, the Council also raised concerns regarding the Fijian culture and customs. Also, the Chiefs highlighted the need for Fijian youths to know their place in the Fijian society and to be prepared for it. Furthermore, they were also concerned about native resources and called for its proper survey and ownership. There are many challenges confronting us in the exercise of our leadership among the Fijian people themselves. Perhaps most importantly, we must continue to demonstrate that the system we represent is made for an era of sweeping change. The titles bequeathed to us through our indigenous heritage speak of Fijian identity and culture and the integrity of the Vanua, uh, of the Vanua. The chiefs, the land and the people are one. That is the concept that holds 
Ethan will be developed. And now, more than ever, we must see to it that it is preserved and adapted for the 21st century. The Great Council of Chiefs, in its 135 years of leadership of the Fijian people and advising governments, faced its toughest battle on April 2007, when Interim Prime Minister Commodore Borengen Bainimarama suspended the august body, calling for a total review. Despite the battles, the enormous challenges, the insecurities, the challenges, the insults about the Great Council of Chiefs, the advisory body will forever be credited for its ability to withstand tribulation and survive its battle in their quest to carry out its role for the Fijian people and for the common good of all. They have kept abreast of the changing times and, when forced to, have risen to the occasion. This august body, that has its roots in the 1800s, has made wise decisions. Not only for the benefit of the Fijian people, but also for all who have come to call Fiji home. In the context of the global society we all now live in, the Great Council of Chiefs is perhaps the only body of its type in existence. Its ever-assuring voice has helped in so many ways shape Fiji into what it is today. It can be said that without this august body we would not have modernization in its present form nor would we have adopted the Western concepts of governance and democracy. It's clear from the analysis of the Great Council of Chiefs' history that its establishment was associated with various attempts at the formation of governments in Fiji. One hundred and thirty five years of existence, with one hundred and ten meetings throughout the country, finally a house to call their own. The complex is a symbol of hope for the future generations of Fiji.